headquarters for the city of Dayton, Ohio Police Department. You know, if, if people start bashing on police officers for dragging handicapped people around by the hair, then nobody's going to want to be a police officer. You know what I'm saying? Hey, everybody, it's James Freeman. Many of you may have already seen this interaction where a police officer drags a paraplegic man from his car by the hair. But today, we're going to talk about this video in a context that I haven't seen other people talking about it in. And that is the context of the reason they stopped him in the first place the failed drug war. A lot of people want to talk about this incident and talk about how police can improve in terms of how they deal with the handicapped, how they deal with the disabled, what the police could have done better in the situation. But if we're truly going to be honest with ourselves about how to stop things like this from happening, then let's talk about treating the disease, not just the symptoms. We shouldn't be talking about how the police should have acted better in this particular situation. We should be talking about how this situation never should have existed. First, we go to this community incident briefing where the Dayton Police Department tries to rationalize why it's okay to drag a handicapped man by his hair from his car. The following community briefing is intended to provide you with information about a recent incident here in the city of Dayton. This briefing has been prepared so that you may have a better understanding of the circumstances which led to the use of force based upon what we know at this time in the investigation. We understand this incident has sparked a lot of emotional reaction here in the community in Dayton, Ohio, and we ask for your patience as we investigate this incident to its fullest. On Thursday, September 30th at 1227 p.m., officers were on patrol in the 1900 block of West Grand Avenue here in Dayton, Ohio. Officers had been alerted to a suspected drug house in that area, which they were monitoring for detectives of the Narcotics Bureau of the Dayton Police Department. Officers initiated a traffic stop on a white Audi that was observed leaving the residence. Officers approached and made initial contact with the driver, Clifford Owensby, who provided them with his identification. Officers took his identification back to the cruiser and ran his information based upon Owensby's felony drug history and weapon history, along with him leaving a suspected drug house, the officers requested a Narcotics Bureau canine to respond to the scene for a free air sniff on the motor vehicle. But let me point out that neither leaving a known drug house or having a criminal history constitutes reasonable, articulable suspicion for a stop. Now, via the department's own admission by press release, those were the only two reasons for the stop in the first place. State versus Schmidt is an almost identical case to what's going on here. In State versus Schmidt, the police were also allegedly sitting outside of a known drug house. Allegedly, the police also knew that Schmidt didn't have a driver's license, so they waited outside for Schmidt to come out and drive away, at which time they initiated a stop for driving without a license. Unlike the case in Dayton, Ohio, nobody was arguing that the police didn't have reasonable suspicion to stop Schmidt for driving without a license. But here's where these two cases parallel and where case law comes into play about whether leaving a known drug house is reasonable suspicion for a stop. Police in Schmidt's case used the fact that she was allegedly leaving a known drug house and the fact that she had a criminal history to expand the stop and call in a dog to sniff for drugs. While Schmidt's defense attorney didn't challenge the basis for the initial traffic stop, he was asking for the results of the search to be thrown out based on the fact that the search was unlawful based on the fact that leaving a known drug house and having a prior criminal history was not RAS to expand the stop beyond the suspended license. The district court denied Schmidt's motion to suppress the evidence. However, and here's the important part, a court of appeals overturned that decision. The court relied on State versus Miller in concluding that Schmidt's location prior to the stop did not support the expansion of the search. The court wrote, speaking with and being cl in close proximity with others suspected of criminal activity without any more may be insufficient to reach the threshold of reasonable articulable suspicion. In reference to the police using Schmidt's prior criminal history to support the expansion of the stop, the court reasoned that allowing officers to use someone's criminal history to support an expansion of a search would effectively allow officers to seize convicted felons at any time and for any reason. So we don't expect the police to understand the law because they don't need to understand it, they're not accountable to it. 
But for the rest of us who are accountable to the law and therefore need to be able to understand it, we all know that this stop was completely unlawful from the very beginning. We all know that under the law, someone's criminal history is not reasonable articulable suspicion for a stop. We also know that someone possibly being associated with someone who's possibly associated with crime is also not reasonable articulable suspicion to initiate a stop. And that ruling quite specifically states that someone leaving a drug house is not reasonable articulable suspicion of a crime. So the department admitted in their briefing that the real reason for the stop was that he was leaving a known drug house. But even if the real reason for the stop was illegal tint, the officers still didn't have reason to expand the stop to searching for drugs based on him coming from a drug house. Based upon Owensby's felony drug history and weapon history, along with him leaving a suspected drug house, the officers requested a Narcotics Bureau canine to respond to the scene for a free air sniff on the motor vehicle. Officers reapproached the vehicle and asked Mr. Owensby to exit. Dayton Police Department policy requires that occupants of the vehicle to exit for their own safety and the safety of the canine officer to perform this free air sniff. Officers explained this policy to Mr. Owensby and requested for him to exit the vehicle. Owensby stated that he couldn't because he was paraplegic. Officers then offered to assist Mr. Owensby in getting out of the vehicle, to which he refused. Owensby asked for a supervisor to respond to the scene and continued to refuse commands or assistance from the officers to get out of the vehicle. As the officers began to remove him from the vehicle, Owen Speed grabbed onto the steering wheel of the car in an attempt to prevent the officers from removing, from removing him from the motor vehicle. He was then forcibly removed from the vehicle. Officers then placed Owen Speed on the ground in order to secure him. Officers had to then pull his arms behind his back in order to handcuff him. There was also an unrestrained three-year-old child in the backseat of the vehicle who was later removed by an officer. After being handcuffed, Owensby was then taken to a local hospital where he was examined and released. A large bag of cash was also found in the front floorboard of the vehicle containing $22,450 in U.S. currency. The Narcotics Bureau canine also alerted on that money, meaning that the money had been in close proximity to illegal drugs. <laughs> Let me preemptively apologize about the audio in this video. I believe that when the police department did the broadcast live showing the public this video, they had some feedback and so there's a lot of echo. I apologize about that beforehand. So you can cooperate and get out of the car. I'll drag you out of the car. Do you see your two options here? I know I got right. I would like to do, sir. I would like for you to do 
Due to the graphic nature of thugs with badges dragging a paraplegic man out of his car by his hair, I'm going to skip this part. But if this is the type of thing that you want to see, I'll put a link in the description to the disturbing video. Notice that these two officers are pretty big guys, and the victim is not that big of a guy. They could easily pick their victim up and carry him to the car. But in what appears to me to be an act of complete disrespect and humiliation, instead they choose to drag him to the car like an animal. Mind you, this is not just a case of somebody being non-compliant and refusing to walk themselves back to the car. He's incapable of walking. So now let's talk about the root of the problem. The initial cause for so many of these contacts where people's rights are violated and they're abused, the war on drugs. In the 1970s, when the war on drugs started in the United States, an estimated 1.3% of the population was addicted to illicit drugs. By the year 2010, that number was almost identical, despite the fact that $1.5 trillion had been spent to fight the war. I don't believe that that $1.5 trillion even accounts for the cost of incarcerating people as a result of the drug war. Because in this same time period, the number of prisoners in federal and state prisons increased from 196,000 to 1,570,000. Now, there's a number of reasons that people are incarcerated in state, local, and federal prisons across the nation. And I'm sure that there's some that will argue that there's no correlation between the rising spending on the drug war and the rising incarceration rate. Based on this graph, you can see that only a small number of people are actually incarcerated for drugs, while a much larger percentage are incarcerated for violent crimes and property crimes. We may never know how many of those violent crimes and property crimes are directly related to the war on drugs. But we do have some good examples of what prohibition actually does. In the 1920s, with the prohibition of alcohol, there was a 78% increase in homicides. There was also a 9% increase in theft and burglaries, and a 13% increase in assault and battery. We will probably never know how many violent crimes have been committed as a result of the war on drugs, especially since this violent crime right here will probably never be attributed to the war on drugs. In a statement to News Center 7 Monday, Interim Chief Matt Carper referred to this as a drug investigation and traffic stop and said the department's Professional Standards Bureau is investigating what happened to include the officer's actions and any allegations of misconduct. And City Manager Shelley Dickstein promised a thorough review to ensure that we are held accountable to the public. Owensby told us what he would like to see. I feel like they need to train their officers to um, deal with disabled people in a, in a more efficient manner, you know, treat them with respect. And I don't disagree that the police went about removing a disabled man from his car all wrong. But guys, what about the fact that they never should have attempted to remove anybody from the car at all? 